Hi there, and welcome back to the Fuse Show. Uh, my name is David Tran. I'm a co-founder of Xfusion.io and also the co-host of this show. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my uh, guest, uh, Vedran. Uh, he's the founder of Treble and a longtime full-stack developer. Thanks for joining us on the show. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, David, for having me. It's really nice to meet you, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you about anything uh, we uh, set our mind to. So before this episode, you sent me an email telling me how you've been a developer since you're the age of 15. Can you explain yeah. to me how you were exposed to building software at such a young age and, and uh, what led you to like really develop a passion for it? Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the age of 15, I, I, you know, I was born in 87, right? So it's basically almost at the right time when the internet started booming. And so it was like a combination of things. But uh, I, I grew up in a really small uh, town in, in, in Croatia, and um, we were like one of the few folks that had like a 486 or whatever it was called at that time, a really old computer, right? And you can basically do anything on it except, uh, you know, fire up DOS and uh, maybe do something else, right? So that's where, where, where I got exposed to this thing. So the first thing, of course, you needed to learn. If you wanted to use the computer, you needed to learn how to use the command prompt, if you will, right? So I got exposed to that early uh, on and I kind of got used to uh, using the command prompt versus like a uh, GUI or something. So mm -hmm. I started dabbling. Uh, I got, you know, at that time, everything was, was new, nobody knew anything. So I started exploring, exploring. Uh, and slowly I began, you know, to learn some of those things. I began to use QBasic to, to do some basic math. I always kind of sucked at math, but I, I, I could get it to work with when I, when I coded it. So uh, that's how I, I started early on. And uh, as, as time flew by, I think like in, uh, when, when I was like, uh, I think around 15 or 16, I, I kind of discovered the internet and the web. Uh, <laughs> that's the first time I, I, I could get my hands on it, like in an unlimited capacity. Mm. Uh, and I, I just started learning about, uh, you know, uh, PHP. I, I can't tell you why PHP, but it was like one of the first things that, that, that I saw and I immediately liked it. You could write anything and it mm. would show up on the screen. You didn't need to compile it. I right. hated the fact that you needed to compile C and stuff like that. This was like almost instantly you see the result. And that's, mm. I think that, that would, that's what drew me the most to, to like PHP and the web. The fact that you can instantly see uh, what you're doing, you know? So are either of your parents engineers or do you have a family member who's an engineer? Like, I think most people didn't have access to computers until further in life. So, so yeah, basically my, I don't know like why, but my dad, uh, he finished uh, to be, uh, he was into design like uh, books and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. he worked uh, at a print shop uh, before uh, he joined the army, whatnot. And I, I think he he was always doing something print related, uh, right? So that's why, why he wanted like a, access to a computer. Uh, and I don't know, I guess he was a visionary in that, in that sense. And he just kind of... Hmm you know, always bought us computers. And uh, I have to say, you know, every time something uh, new came out, he was somehow able to get it, you know, not not the most up to date one, but we had a computer we had I had access to computers since the, since I can remember. If you had to summarize your favorite thing about building software, what would you say it was at that stage of your life? Oh man, uh, at that stage of the life, just the pure fact that when you write something and it works, that satisfaction that you get of like trying it a hundred different times and then the hundred, the first time it works and you really realize, oh snap, uh, so I don't curse, oh snap, it was like a semicolon and that's why it didn't work 10 times before. So so basically, you know, that, that satisfaction is just something that, uh, you know, I can chase every time I develop something new to, till this day. Just the fact that, you know, you spend an amount of time doing something and then it all just simply comes together into this beautiful thing and it does what you wanted it to do. Do you remember if there was a particular project that you were especially proud of when you were first dabbling into <laughs> software? So, but when, when I, uh, right around the time when I got like my own personal computer, 
Uh, I remember that who wants to be a millionaire was like the, the, the most rad thing that ever happened, right? You have to understand in Croatia, we're a bit behind uh, on the US. So, so the timeline might be a bit skewed, but uh, at that time it was very popular. And I remember that, you know, one of the, there was like a magazine in Croatia where uh, the only one actually uh, about computers and you would send them, uh, either email them or send them a USB stick with like your code. And then they would either feature it in the magazine or say, oh. they, yeah, say something nice. So basically I spent like a lot of time developing uh, who wants to be a millionaire in QBasic. And I, I it was, you know, it, pr from a programming perspective, it's very easy, right. To do it now, but back then it was like uh, a lot of work to do. And I spent like ages uh, doing <laughs> this very comp complicated game. And then, you know, I sent it in and, and they said, you know, at that time there was like already visual basic, right? So you had a, a GUI and everything else. Uh, and they, they rejected me and said, you know, hmm. uh, uh, it, it's you, you're, you know, you need to be making GUIs and stuff like that. But that was probably the most proudest thing I, I ever did. Hmm. So how, how did you go from being exposed to software in early stage to ultimately, um, well, I guess it's kind of obvious that you became a software engineer of some kind, but how did you go from be, yeah. building software for yourself and maybe like a few friends and family into building it for multiple clients and building a team around that? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I kind of, I went from my hometown to, uh, to Zagreb being, which is the capital of Croatia to, to essentially study. Uh, I did uh, study engineering, right? Uh, and, you know, as a student, you, you're looking for ways to get some more money in. Uh, and uh, essentially, I started, you know, in Zagreb, it was very easy to, to there's like a million people uh, in one place. So it's very easy to, to find opportunities. And I, I kind of started, you know, just meeting people online uh, who needed something uh, to do with web, like web design or something. And I, I started slowly doing that, um, you know, doing jobs for like 200 bucks. Uh, and it was like, you hmm. know, <laughs> I'm going to be rich for the rest of the year with, with that much money. But uh, in any case, uh, I started slowly doing that. And then by the time I kind of finished college, it was like either I go work for somebody else uh, and I have worked as a student for multiple other people. And I just, in Croatia, it's like mostly... People who, who at that point were doing websites didn't know a lot of, about websites. Mm -hmm. So they would usually, you know, require me to do something that I didn't want to do and wasn't, a, you know, something that was the right thing to do, right? Uh, so essentially, I, I, I just concluded that either I'm going to spend the rest of my life, you know, working for somebody else or I'm going to try to open essentially a company. So uh, with uh, uh, my current co-founder, we actually opened a development company uh, in Croatia, right? Um, so that's how I started with, with that part. How did you find clients? <laughs> it was, uh, I think, you know, when you, when I think about it retrospectively, uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it, it's obvious, but uh, I think at that moment it was very tough. And, uh, you know, for, I, I would say that for the first year, I don't think we even paid ourselves like two salaries, maybe the two of us. So it's like, you know, not a lot of work. It was mostly like doing, working for somebody who, you know, or somebody who might recommend you, uh, very low paying jobs. And, you know, essentially that that's what, it, unless you have clients before you open the company, that's what happens. But uh, believe it or not, uh, we had like, my co-founder had a few friends who already had an agency and they were, uh, I'm not gonna say fed up, but they had this client who they, they just, you know, for some reason weren't interested in anymore. And they're like, here, you know, you wanna take this guy, he's got this project. Uh, and we took him on uh, and actually that client has been our clients for 10 years now. So basically, oh. Yeah, that guy uh, kept just building things online. I think we, we worked with him for probably, his name is Erland, by the way, hi Erland. Uh, uh, we worked with him for eight out of 10 years. I think he had like a brief period of two years where he, he did something else, but mostly uh, we worked uh, with him on, on many projects. And then uh, something similar, again, somebody else recommended us to a client in the U.S., uh, called Jason, and we started working with him uh, as well. 
and then slowly uh, as we did good they started recommending us uh, sure. but more importantly at that time like responsive design was just on the web just beginning and we kind of uh you know i when i saw it i immediately loved it because i always I, I, the one thing that I could never build is uh, mobile apps, right? So I suck at iOS development, Swift development, Android, Java, all of that is so foreign to me. Uh, and I, I thought, okay, this is great. Now I'm going to do, you know, apps with responsive design. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote a few articles about responsive design and about Bootstrap. Twitter Bootstrap was uh, called mm -hmm. at the time. And people like really loved it. And we got a lot of clients from there and it, it, it mostly after that became about recommendation and recognition. Right. So, yeah. Hmm. Was there, so like on that, on that journey of like finding clients and building your company's revenue, was yeah. that like one of those experiences where there's like a hockey stick level of growth after a certain point where like there's a ton of people referring you to the point that you couldn't even take on all the jobs? Yeah. Essentially I would say after five years in, it became like, just you know we we get to pick who who we mm -hmm. want to work with we get to pick projects we we started rejecting projects and i think at that you know at that time you, you just get to a certain level where you could do like two three projects a year that are bigger in size you know and and instead of doing like 20 smaller projects uh, and so on and so forth which is much better because you develop a deeper relationship mm -hmm. with the client you get to do a lot more than than if you have a limited amount of time so yeah, I would say, you know, if you're doing like, I remember when I was starting, I had like this landlord, it doesn't matter, uh, who, who, who kind of, you know, in a, in a weird way, he was like a, a, an early mentor of mine, you know, huh. and he would sit down and he would, we would talk about things and among, amongst the other things, he, he was also like a business guy and he would always tell me, you know, uh, in order to, to, to to see if you're succeeded 10 years is a good measuring period, right? If mm. you succeed before you, you've done a phenomenal job, right? And if you do it in 10 years, that's still re really good, you know? So uh, I think if, if you do it in between five to 10 years, uh, that's, that's, that's where, where you can expect it. And when you, you can, you know, it's a good thing then. Hmm. And at that five year mark, how big was your team? Uh, we always actually kept our team very small. Uh, oh. I think at, at the maximum, our team was actually all mostly five people plus some outsiders. And the reason for that is, uh, I'm, like I said, I, I like to do things, uh, you know, on my own, uh, mm -hmm. not because I want to, but mostly because, uh, I, I never could find people who are actually, who love what they do uh, mm -hmm. while, while we were looking. So I would handle mostly all the back end, front end uh, stuff. Darko would handle all the design, uh, and I would do the sales. Uh, Darko would help on. Darko would do financing and stuff like that. And then when when we uh, met Tia, uh, who's our iOS developer in, in Treble, you know she she kind of handled the the iOS the mobile part. Uh, so I didn't have to do that. Uh, hmm. And we grew uh, a few more other people and we could always get the job uh, done. Again, when we needed Android developers, we would always have like uh, a friend of ours who, who usually just does it per a project basis. Hmm. Were you, how did you find those people to hire? So it, it's it's a mix. Uh, again, when you do development, you 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 know people. You just you know follow people. You you meet hmm. them on Twitter and meetups. So usually some of them uh, are like that, and some were again recommendations where we ask somebody, "Hey, do you know somebody?" But hmm. mostly the best you know the best programmers actually come from from like a recommendation from another programmer who says, "Oh, I worked with this guy. He's he's like really great." And to be honest, most good programmers will always, always work somewhere else. And, you know, you can never hire them full time. <laughs> if I had a, if I had a dollar for every programmer that told me I, I don't do full, uh, full time in the past month, I would probably be a millionaire. By then. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember what are some like the projects that you're the most proud of building? If you're allowed to talk about them? Uh, we are. Yeah. I mean, it, it really, uh, it depends. Like we've had clients like Porsche, Hugo Boss, Barilla, Bayer, like these, these were all like big sounding clients, but not all of them were actually great clients. Hmm. Uh, 
I one one project that I uh, that I fondly remember was actually about Hugo Boss. They had this campaign. Uh, it had something to do with uh, light shine the light, whatever lights on, and we developed this website where if you came to the website, let's say from the morning till like 3 p.m., uh, you would see prescription glasses. The website would be uh, a lot lighter in tones and everything else. But if you came after like 3, 4 p.m., uh, you would see sunglasses hmm. uh, and vi vi vice versa, right? It would get darker and so on and so forth. So essentially that was a really, uh, really cool, you know. It's cool, yeah. Yeah, cool campaign, right, from, from their part. Uh, and then we've done like the most proudest one, I think to date would be the platform that we've actually developed with our current, uh, uh, the, the longest client that I've, uh, that I've told you Erland. Um, so he's got this really cool app, uh, uh called audio auto picks. And, uh, what, what he does is essentially you upload images to his platform, like of products or cars. And then real editors edit those images and kind of return them back to the original clients via the platform, right? Uh, and the sheer amount of volume that these guys process is like 10 terabytes of images uh, hmm. uh, per year, right? So it's like a lot of images and the system works nonstop 365 days a year. So for, from like a programming perspective, it's actually a very, uh, we did a very good job if I might add. So Hugo Boss is a fairly recognizable name. I feel like if you go down the streets of yeah. America, most people recognize that name. How would you court them as a client? Was that a referral? Uh, so yeah, yeah, we actually uh, it, we didn't plan that, but we actually got into uh, we got connected to many other development companies uh, around the world. Like hmm. we had, so for example, we had one guy, Phil. Uh, hi, Phil. Uh, he's uh, he had a company in Dubai uh, and he was the only guy, right? He didn't even know how to program. He didn't know how to design. He was mostly, you know, a sales guy who had the client. So it was, you know, in his interest to get a team who can do a lot of these jobs for him. We had the same in Germany, in Switzerland, in, in, in New York, in LA. So we had a lot of these, I would say unique uh, situations where somebody had like another agency they had cool jobs and we would do them. So essentially, you know, a lot of these jobs and names that I rec that, that I, I, I dropped here actually came from them. Some came directly to us, but most of them were actually from, from a recommendation from them. Hmm. And how did you go from building software for clients to discovering, um, the, the desire to build trouble? <laughs> so I will like, uh, We've always, I've always wanted to, to build something like even like my dad, you, you know, we would always have conversations about, about things. He would always say the only time you're going to succeed if you build, you know, something on, on your own, which, you know, nowadays people say that you're making money while you sleep, you know, that's the same reference, right? Mm -hmm. So, so he's like, you'll never be able to work as much and as long to make, uh, the, 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 the amount of money that maybe you want, or maybe, you know, you deserve whatever. Mm. Uh, so I, I always wanted to build a product. We've built products before. Like I've, I've built smaller products here in Croatia that, you know, I just, an image at, at that time, an image hosting website was one of them. I don't know, like a, before Facebook was a thing, we built like a social club for students online in Croatia. So we've built, we've dabbled with that uh, a lot. We also build a lot of pro products for our clients, right? So every essentially project we did in the past five, six years was a full product, platform, whatever service, whatever it is. So we've seen a lot of good stories, mm -hmm. uh, but we've also seen a lot of bad stories, right? Startups go from getting millions to, to, to disappearing from the face of the earth, we not getting paid, Etc. Etc. Right. Okay. Uh, so we, as far as trouble goes, it's like it started off as okay. We're gonna try to solve some of our pro uh, own problems. Like you said, we got at one point an overload of projects. Uh, we had uh, with our client Jason. We actually did uh, a few projects for the ACLU, and we ended up running like fifty apps in the States for, for every uh, state in the USA, uh, that meant 50 APIs, you know, mm. so it was like unbearable just to 
essentially monitor what's going on on those APIs, you know, and you would get reports, oh, you know, the app crashed. And, and because we were the only ones who kind of did our job very well, then our client would be like, can you at least investigate? Let's try to figure out if it's like the mobile app, it's, if it's the API. So my, my days would be spent just like trying to figure stuff out, you know? And, and, and at that point I said, you know, this has to stop. We have to, you know, there has to be a better way. I can't spend, you know, five days researching a report from a, a guy in Arizona and then learning he, he didn't have internet or what, hmm. whatnot, right? So, so we started building like a rough prototype internally for, for our company. Uh, we got it to a stage where essentially it was working, but the problem is it was slow, right? I mean, you're, you're an engineer, right? So, uh, when you, the, the way that we approach treble and what treble essentially does is it's a, it's a package, it's an SDK for a programming language and you put it onto your API and it monitors every single request and sends it in parallel app presumably or not presumably. Well, after it's done with, uh, showing it to your user, it sends it to, uh, to treble. Hmm. So we, we, we had a lot of latency issues then, and, and we actually dropped the project. I said this, you know, we'll never be able to figure it out. Uh, either we're going to go bankrupt with, hmm. with the AVS costs and server costs, or there's just no way. Right. And, uh, we still used it. You know, I would, when I had a problem, I would turn it on. Um, then I would, you know, look for problems or, or see what people are, were doing. And then I turned it off because again, it had an impact on your API. It wasn't much, but it was like half a second, 300 mm -hmm. milliseconds, whatever. Right. And I dropped it for, I would say a good year. Right. I, I tried to figure it out. I didn't, I, I was never able to figure it out. And then actually randomly, you know, developing for, for, uh, on another client, something I was, I use, uh, when my, uh, girlfriend, uh, future fiance is not in town, I would usually put something on the TV, like an AVS seminar or, or, or something on the TV and I would develop. Right. And on, on that seminar, they started talking about some of the things that, that kind of, I thought were interesting. And I thought, you know, wait, this, this could be applicable to what we're doing and it could, you know, reduce the latency by, you know, a lot and reduce our costs. And within like a few days, I, I kind of figured it out. And now, you know, since then we're running, uh, we're, we don't impact your API. We're as scalable as I, I would say Amazon, you know, uh, and, uh, we can, we, the most beautiful thing was we don't have an impact. So at that point I realized, okay, let's do it. Uh, I think this could be a good product. Uh, I don't know a lot of pr products who can do it. And we started working on a design Tia and I started drawing things out because, you know, as much as designers are great, but you know, you still need to explain to a designer, what's an API, what is important when you're designing an API. Uh, so we did a lot of that work for Darko and he, he kind of nailed it off the park with, with the original design. Uh, and we, we just never stopped building, I would say. It's always interesting where uh, inspiration can come from. It comes yeah. from the most unusual sources. Yeah. And it's almost as um, interesting relationship where when you're not looking for it, it comes to you. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think like subconsciously, you're always looking for that. You know, I'm like, you know, where, you know, is this something that I should hear about? I know I reviewed like absolutely everything that ABS and Azure offered. And, you know, I had some crazy ways on how we could do it, but not, not this so sophisticated, if you will. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is crazy. Yeah. So, uh, back at Uber, I think the, the, the tool that you're building at Treble, an analytics platform for APIs, almost every major company, every large corporation has some version of it in house, but it takes like a massive number of engineers to both maintain it as well as like, make sure everyone's like implementing it to its like best, <laughs> what, best, uh, the, use num case. the number one question that, that VCs have asked me, like, you know, how, why you, why did you build it? Like, you know, how come you're the only one? And I, and I, and I said the same thing you said, probably every developer in the world has uh, developed a version of Febble, uh, for a smaller project, a bigger project. They just never uh, got it to this scale. Right. So like you said, I know, I, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know the insights, uh, and, uh, in Uber, but you could definitely share. Uh, but yeah, we've essentially built this because like I said, 
we would do something similar uh, on a smaller scale on each mm -hmm. project. And this just kind of makes it, you know, a game changer and, and makes it 10 times more simpler than anything we've seen on their market. And, and in terms of what you do as a whole rounded product, uh, this is, this is what, what you need. It's like, it's not built. We didn't build it for backend developers only. We build it for app developers, for QA mm -hmm. people, uh, for CEOs and stuff like that. So you originally built it for your own use case, so you can benefit from it and yeah. out. How did you start to find paying customers for Treble? Yeah, so again, we come back. We had the luxury of our uh, clients from our agency. So essentially, you it's know. It's not luck, that's skill. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, but we at that point in time, we were like, we had a pool of people who are technical enough to understand what we're building mm, and the, they understand the advantages. Right. So when I told, uh, I, I remember I had, uh, we, one of our clients in the U S had, uh, had this, uh, project manager co called Jacob. Hi Jacob. And he would, uh, like they had a bunch of developers and, and usually it took those developers a lot longer to figure out what is wrong than me. Right. So mm. he would always come to me and tell, Hey, can you just check if they're doing it or okay or not? So the first person who I actually reached out to and said, Hey, Jacob, I got this solution for you. You know, maybe you can now see what the app is doing. You could, you can literally open the app and see what, what it's doing on an API level in real time. He's like, Yes, this is great. I'm not going to have to ask you any questions. I'm like, yes, that is absolutely true here. Use it for free, you know, be the first person. Uh, and you know, we started doing that with some of our uh, other clients and slowly, you know, uh, some of them started paying, uh, some of them more importantly started recommending to other developers, other clients. And that's how we originally got to a few uh, uh, first clients and we were able to, I would say without even launching, we've processed in like eight months, uh, around two, 3 million API requests, mm. uh, which is a really nice test for us uh, in terms of scalability. Uh, and at that point we were running the whole stack and I'll know you, you'll find this impressive for like 10, 10 to 15 bucks a month. So huh. like the entire stack. Yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, that was really for us, uh, a really nice thing. And, uh, we actually started then, you know, making some features for them. Like every time a new person would come in, they would use treble in a, in a way that we never predicted, right? Some hmm. of them used treble like we wanted to, you know, while they're developing an API and they, they would share the documentation with their developers, developers, app developers would see what they're doing in real time, et cetera, et cetera. They would debug things. But, you know, as we onboarded some non-technical people, they started using treble for things like, uh, marketing purposes. So we, we had this client who would, you know, he wasn't very good at technical things, but you know, just by talking to him, he realized that, that when, when he sees an API call titled, uh, you know, users slash ID slash subscribe, it meant that one of those users actually subscribed to what he wanted. And he would then, you know, either pick up the phone and call that user and, and try to offer him something more or email, mm -hmm. right? So he used it more like a sales tools. Then yeah, we yeah. had people uh, who were, who had remote teams in India, right? A guy from the United States would, uh, hire a team, uh, in India to, to do his uh, apps and, and stuff like that. He would use treble to monitor when and how they're working. Right. So he would wake up, so he would see how many APIs requests they've made. Were there any new APIs, uh, endpoints they created, stuff like that. So he would use that as a reference point on how much work they did that day. And he actually, one of them actually told us, can you somehow make like a qual quality section for, for the API? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if they're building good, good APIs. So within like a couple of weeks, uh, we, we actually built like a quality control feature into treble. So we measure the quality of your API on every single request. And we give, give that to, to everybody in like an understandable format. Uh, so we do, did add a lot of, uh, interesting features. The most, probably the most interesting one was while, when, when our VCs decided to invest, they, they kinda, they did technical due diligence, you know, 
And the guy who was doing technical due diligence came to me and said, this is great. You know, I wish the only thing I wish you would do is if you added open API spec support to, mm -hmm. to your documentation, because Treble kind of generates documentation, but we, we, we always did it in our, for, in our own format. Yeah. So within like two days, I shoot him an email. Hey man, here's open API spec support. You can do it now. He was very happy about that. Yeah. Is that common for, for VCs to like walk through all the, like to walk through the level of like code and documentation? So, I mean, it really, if, if it's a good VC and they, they know what they're doing and, uh, you know, they want to understand the product, I would say, yes, you should mm. uh, find somebody who is interested uh, to, to that level, right? Uh, but uh, most of the VCs that we've spoken to, again, we ran a demo with most of them for at least like 45 minutes to an hour. There were some who didn't want to, but we didn't consider them serious investors. I think if, you, if you're investing in, in a technical founder, if you're investing in, in a technical product, then you got to at least know something. It's, it's okay if you don't know the whole thing, but at least try to understand what, what the person is, is telling you. I didn't know a lot of the things, a lot of the words they were uh, talking about, like CAC, whatever the mm -hmm. short term mm -hmm. for marketing are, but I learned them because, or at least I'm learning them because I'm interested in that. Was it always your intent to raise funding for this project? Nope. We had no such intent, absolutely. So we the, the idea that we had was, let's see if the product can work. Uh, and the way that, you know, as a developer, you tend to go to other developers and ask them, hey, would you use this? And they would say, and the problem was most of them said, yeah, this is amazing, right? And then, when, as, again, as a developer, you know you have a problem because everybody's saying yes to you. So we said, okay, let's switch, switch up the crowd and let's try to find somebody who, who does this for a living. Let's try somebody who, sorry for, for, for doing this, but, you know, shits on other products, right, for trashing uh, ideas. And we, we kind of stumbled upon Web Summit, which is like uh, a conference online. At that point, uh, during Corona, it was held online. And uh, met this guy, Katal, from Web Summit, and he kind of, he literally nudged us uh, to go to Web Summit. He said, you, you don't have anything to lose. Go in. We have a startup program. Uh, you know, you can meet other users, investors, other companies. You'll get good feedback, if nothing else. I said, fine. You know, it was like 300 bucks or whatever. Uh, it was online. So we just, you know, it had a few ABS stocks I was interested in. So I said, let's do it. And what they do at Web Summit is, is it's really cool. Like they give you this app and you can, you see everybody who's attending, everybody from like all the famous actors, actresses to, to uh, your, your average neighborhood developer, right? And you can connect with them on that app. It's good, really good for networking, networking. but also uh, they have a large pool of investors and they kind of, if, if you apply there, they can all see your startup, they can learn about it without having to actually talk to you. So at that point, when Web Summit started, uh, we started receiving requests from various uh, uh, VCs, you know, hey, we want to learn more, we're interested, sounds interesting. Uh, at that point, we didn't even have a pitch deck, we didn't have a business plan, absolutely nothing. So basically, we've been speaking to investors all September. Uh, November and December without having a, a pitch deck, right? We didn't even know how much we wanted to raise. And then everybody was like, we like the product, but guys, you gotta, you, you gotta have a pitch deck at least, right? You gotta tell us how much money, if you want the money, how much you want. And then we sat down, we, we, we kind of formalized it. We wanted to do it more for us because again, we're everybody here is technical. I mean, we've been running a business, but writing a business plan just sounds F to me as a developer, horrible. Uh, and uh, we kind of sat down, we wanted to do it for ourselves. And then as time went on, we realized that, you know, these VCs and, and, and these business guys had a positive feedback as well. And then, then we said, okay, you know, we could either, we've already had a company, we've bootstrapped that one, we know how it goes, you know, we know the struggle. It's not going to be easy. It might be easier because we, we got some of that money from the agency, mm -hmm. 
but you you're never gonna be able to do some of the things that you could do uh, with, uh, with with an investment, right? You'll never do experiments like you uh, like you can do now, right? You'll always be more conservative. You you'll try to yeah. save as much money as you can. Uh, and you know we essentially chose uh, a team from London now top they gave us a really nice deal uh, but more importantly regardless you know the money is great all of that whoever says it's not it is great but more importantly we got a team that kind of understood what we were trying to do and was on board with everything that we were trying to do which mm. is you know we're not I'm not in the business of doing this and then reselling the data to somebody else right, We're right. here because we want to help other developers. You know, this is how we approach that. This is what we're going to do in the next X years. So they kind of really understood that they were on, on board. Uh, and actually a lot of other, which, which, you know, I, we've spoken to about 10 VCs. We've gotten th three term sheets and I, I can't out of 10 of them, I would say eight of them uh, are really good, you know, investors and they did everything that they could to, to make sure to give us a good deal to, to hmm. listen to us. So I don't have a bad word about any of them. So um, <clears throat> you were mentioning it earlier, but I'd love to hear you expand upon like, what are some of the things that you have done or plan to do with capital versus having just stayed on the bootstrap path? Well, I mean, when you, when you think about it, right. Uh, we have to develop an SDK for every every language, right? Right now, we supported PHP, Laravel, a framework of PHP, which I developed. Uh, we support Node, uh, but then we were able to quickly add .NET Core, .NET Standard, Ruby, and Golang, right? So if we if we had to, you know, bootstrap, I would have probably said, okay, let's let's try to dig out which languages are the most popular by statistics. Let's pick three of them. Let's stick with those until we know that that's working, right? Here, I can just we could just simply add new languages without having to worry about every cent. Mm. <clears throat> uh, next, we we're not right now. We're not in the business of of doing marketing, but we can go to Web Summit. You know, yeah. I can pay for the tickets. I can go there. I can have a booth there. Uh, we can go to another conference here in Croatia. We can print the business cards that we want. We can you know pay for some courses that we wanted to. It's just much easier when you don't have to think at the end of the month, will I have enough money? Right. You don't, I think that money is more about, you know, you don't have to stress about mm -hmm. some of the things that you usually would have stressed, or at least you don't have to stress for, for the next X amount of time. And then if you're doing bad, you have to stress. But initially, uh, it just gives you this freedom to kind of potentially unlock any type of cre creativity or wild ideas that you, that you wanted to try. So now that you're working on Treble, I'm assuming at least most of your time, um, who's yeah, running most, your former agency? We've actually shut that off. Uh, okay. We kind of uh, it, it it all kind of it's funny how you how you you mentioned at the, at the beginning uh, how things happen when you don't look for it. So essentially, at right around the time when we were trying to make a decision whether to accept the term sheet, we kind of finished the projects that we wanted to finish with our existing clients. Uh, so it was like a natural transition. He, you know, we're going to be here if you need us to, to support this, but you know, you're, you can go on and move on with, with somebody else if, and we'll help you find somebody else. Uh, but so we kind of transitioned some of them to our, uh, friends or somebody who we knew, uh, and some, for some, we're still looking at a replacement, but most hmm. of them have a stable system running. So we kind of left that off and, and, and just said, you know, from now on, uh, most of the, my time or our time is going to be spent uh, building trouble. And, you know, it wasn't, uh, we have very good clients. They were very supportive. Some of them even wanted to invest, but mostly, uh, you know, they were very positive. And to this day, they help us uh, get clients for trouble. Hmm. Do you ever have, do you have that like moment of fear where you're like, oh shoot, I'm, I've been doing this thing for 10 years now and I'm going to transition to doing something entirely absolutely. new. The responsibilities absolutely. are very different. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. I've had many conversations with uh, Tia, with Darko, with myself, with, with a lot of my, you know, even with friends who don't understand anything about this. Uh, and you, 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 you just, like I said, I wrote a blog post uh, about taking the, the investment. And I, I remember I titled it a leap of faith. 
uh, I don't know if you ever played Assassin's Creed, like it uh-huh. had, okay. You, you remember when you would get to a high building, like really high building, and then you would jump and it would, <laughs> that, that, that would be like a leap of faith. Hmm. So I just said, you know, you, you know, if, if I don't do it now, I'll probably never do it again. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I plan to get married next year, plan to have kids. Uh, so, you know, uh, some of these things are naturally going to change. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm getting older, not younger. I'm not going to be at the edge of the development for the rest of my life. So, you know, it just seemed like an opportunity where I, where we either try to do something now and hope, uh, you know, it comes together or we just do the old, the same old thing. And the conclusion was we can always go back to doing the same old thing. Uh, and you know, it, this might not come again, if you will. Hmm. Okay. What are some of the things you've learned in making the transition from an agency owner to being a, um, founder <laughs> and runner of a company? Oh man. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that this, this has much more lawyers involved. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever talked to a lawyer prior? Uh, I have, but okay. not, trust me, not to, not to, to, to this degree. Like we have this situation with, with our startup where essentially the, we have like two companies. One is in London, uh, which is where like our headquarters is mm-hmm. and where the, where, where we do business from. And then there's like a branch in Croatia, which is like a service company where, where we work in because we, we got to buy the lock, local lo- law. So there was like a plethora of lawyers on both sides, UK side, the creation side, two sides, we sees us. So that was like a very, um, sobering experience, uh, you know, talking to all of them, just trying to, you know, get a grasp on what, when you, when you're in a discussion with lawyers, that's, that's, that's the funniest thing. They discuss the meaning of words, right? Oh, he said this word that means, and then they start going into like a 30 minute discussion about what that word means. And I'm sitting like, you know, so, uh, I, I think, yeah, like you said, the responsibilities are different, uh, uh, but I think actually the, the, what, what kind of saddens me the most is that I, I thought I would be able to develop a lot more, but mm-hmm. actually I've, I still haven't had like a full day of development. We're trying to hire a bunch of people, uh, but I'm looking forward to, to, to that day where I'm just gonna, you know, have some more time to, to, to basically do some of the, the, the things that, that I personally want, but it is an adjustment again, going from, from that, uh, uh, from an agency to somebody, uh, you know, to having relationships with investors, maintaining those relationships, having a responsibility to, to everybody, to your team, to make sure that everything is moving forward. The product is moving forward. The legal is moving forward, everything. So yeah, it is a different kind of responsibility. How many engineers do you have currently? Oh, we, we, it's the three of us. Uh, oh, and we're okay. just, yeah, we're just opening the, the gates. Uh, it was like the summertime when we got the investment. And everybody was on vacation. Uh, you know, even my mom would send me an out to remind, you know, uh, out to response email. <laughs> uh, so right now we're trying to hire at least uh, 10 to 15 people. Mm. Uh, most of them are actually engineers and some, some of them would be sales and marketing. But at, at the moment it's uh, me um, who basically does all the developments on the platform, uh, you know, everything else that I need to do as, as a CEO, Tia, who does everything related to mobile apps, iOS, Mac OS, uh, marketing. And then Darko on the other hand is like uh, de- a designer slash uh, financing slash admin, admin uh, person. So we're all wearing a multiple hats until we can actually find uh, people who, who will help us, which I hope will be soon. So if anybody, if anybody does something with PHP, MySQL, Laravel, uh, front end, whatever you are, just call me, email me, whatever, uh, you'll get a job. What is your favorite part of being a CEO? Uh, <clears throat> hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. I haven't thought about, uh, that one, uh, a lot. I mean, there's whoever says that, you know, 
whenever you go to a meeting, everybody's always kind of leaning towards you as the CEO. So that's always flattering, right? You could be in a room with 10 other people from our company. Everybody is still facing hmm. the CEO. So that, that is a bit uh, flattering. But I think what, what, what that gives me, uh, gives me the opportunity to speak to people like you, right? Mm -hmm. So I get to talk to, uh, you know, other founders, other developers, podcasters, whoever it is about our product, about, you know, some of the things that we've been through and ho in hopes that we can help somebody, somebody can learn something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, I think the most, the best thing that I can think about at the moment as, as a CEO. So the last question I have is what would you, what advice would you give to a younger version of yourself before you were, before you created trouble and you're in the middle of that process of considering whether you want to take the leap or to stay within uh, the agency world? Uh, do it faster. <laughs> do it sooner. faster. How fast? Uh, much faster and much sooner. Just, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing how much you can dwell on a decision. Uh, you know, sometimes time and people push you to make decisions sooner, but it's so easy to, uh, to be, go, go into that safe spot and, and just do the things that you're used to, right. And not get out of your comfort zone, not try something new, not take a risk. And I think I would say, you know, take more risk, uh, uh, and, and, you know, it might be better. That's what I would uh, say to my younger self. Okay. Well, thanks for your time, Vidron. I've enjoyed this yep. conversation and I look forward to seeing how your company and you evolve over time. Uh, I just want to give you a final opportunity for those in the audience who are, uh, interested in reaching out to you and getting to know you or to follow you and your company's journey, what's the best place for them to do so? Uh, so you can visit our website, uh, treble.com with two L's, or you could find me on LinkedIn uh, or on Twitter or basically any other social media platform, either treble is there or, or I'm there. I mostly tweet and, and write about technology and treble mostly. Uh, kind of uh, writes and tweets about uh, API. So if you're interested in those topics, uh, be sure to follow us. Sounds good. Well, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for the opportunity. And it was really nice uh, talking to you.